Hi, everyone. Welcome to our episode 66. In today's episode, we have an honor guest, Helen Rogin, and we are going to talk about how to create prosperity and por on purpose. And I'm going to introduce her so that you can know a little bit of her background. Helen Rogin is a CPA and CFP, an abundance activist, and has made her life works educating, counseling, and guiding people to grow their, their prosperity and to use it as a force for good in their lives and in the world. She is a co-author and New York Times bestseller of Picture Your Prosperity, Smart Money Moves to Turn Your Vision into Reality. Helen speaks across the globe on creating success and abundance, chock full of left brain credentials, MBA, CPA, certified financial planner, Helen also walks on the right side, balancing values, big picture ideas, meditation, and a sense of humor with her professional training. She's as comfortable talking about the power of compound interest as she is in the power of belief. Helen is a TEDx presenter, and her work has been quoted in such national publication as the New York Times, Money, time.com and forbes.com helen also consults with people to flip the abundance switch and build a better relationship with money by tapping into her years of experience and intuition for personalized messages from money she also leads classes to help consultants coaches and advisors learn to create prosperity on purpose so as you can see, we are going to have a very, very profound conversation about money, beliefs, and creating on purpose. Thank you, Helen, for being here. It's really such an honor. Oh, yeah, I'm so excited to be with you. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to start talking about these interesting topics of prosperity, money, and how someone that has just a traditional background can uh, have a different mindset about the money, combining those intuitive uh, messages that they have and also a creative part where they are more practical, where they can have um, less anchor size to many of those beliefs that usually we learn when we are children, no? Yeah, so um, is... You mentioned in the intro, David, my background was very traditional. For about 28 years, I worked with individuals as a financial advisor. So I helped them invest their money and get from where they were to where they wanted to be. And very early in my career, I became fascinated with how people make money decisions. To me, that was the most interesting part of the work that I did, how some two people could have the same amount of money and have different viewpoints about it, different anxiety levels. And uh, what I realized very early is that there's really two parts to us being great with money. One is, yeah, we live in a material world. You have to take care of things. You have to save and um, hopefully make smart investments. We also live not just in a material world, but in an ethereal world. And there's this whole other part of things that make um, our financial success happen that are about our mindset, about what we believe, about what we put out into the world and what comes back. Mm -hmm. And to me, the magic happens when they're both married. Like if you just had somebody who was awesome at budgeting and running numbers and all of the traditional money type things, but they went home at night and kicked their dog and fought with their partner and they're miserable, like, no, that wouldn't be good, right? We can all think of people, even if you don't know them personally, celebrities or famous people. And then the other hand, if you have somebody who is all about sitting on their meditation pillow, chanting OM, waiting for the universe to provide and doesn't take any actions in the real material world, that doesn't usually work either. I mean, it might, depending on their lifestyle, but if they're operating, you know, not in a cave, meditating all the time, money becomes important in the way that most of us live right now. Yeah. Yes, and it has to have a balance, no? It doesn't have to be an obsession, but it has to be a balance between 
uh, as you mentioned, having freedom to do things in this material world and, and having also a kind of freedom in terms of not becoming so uh, anchored by the status that you have or the kind of luxury that probably society is many times trying to sell us, no? For sure. Yeah. And just the fact that you're making that distinction that a lot of times these things come in from outside of us, it could be our upbringing. Uh, Bruce Lipton, who's a cellular biologist, wrote the book, um, you're shaking your head, you know him, The Biology of Belief. And he says that we develop our subconscious beliefs between conception and age seven. Now, when I read that, when his book first came out, which was many years ago, people weren't talking about money mindset. They weren't talking about limiting money beliefs, but all of a sudden it all fell into place for me. I'm like, oh my God, this is about our money as well. You know, finally, I feel like the financial services industry is paying a little bit of attention to this where for so many years, they never did. It was all about how are you allocating your investments and what are you spending and what are you saving? Um, but these internal thoughts that we have it were developed when we were really little based on what we saw and heard growing up, our experiences, you go through something traumatic, like um, all sorts of things that I can think of now as examples, but the recession in 2008, um, maybe there was a big COVID impact in your yeah. family or your life. You know, all these things, a divorce, all the a bankruptcy, a business failure, all of them add into this filter that we see money through, which some of it can be awesome and helpful. And sometimes it's really limiting and less than excellent. Mm. Yeah. And how can people start um, finding that um, meaning of the money in terms of taking more those beliefs about certain kind of things that can occur externally and not going deep, deep into those beliefs that they know that they don't have the trust, the confidence to get out from that situation because it is almost unconscious, the behavior that oh. certain people are just doing and they are trying to live um, paycheck by paycheck. And they, if you try to ask some kind of question, why do you do that? They just don't have the clue that they are doing it, no? Yeah, so, or, or they blame it on outside things. Oh, yeah. I'm not getting paid enough. I'm, it, or they beat themselves up. You're right, I shouldn't do that. It's terrible, I'm horrible with money. And I think that the first step in this is being aware that you have these thoughts and that they're playing in the background. When you had said, I think most people aren't conscious of this, probably almost everybody's not conscious of this. Yeah. And that's why there's unconscious beliefs. So um, I think one of the first steps is to shine a light on it and to be a little bit more aware to notice what am I thinking? Like, what am I telling myself over and over? And know that just because you say it or think it doesn't mean it's true. So thoughts um, like, I'm really not good with money. It's never, we're going into recession. It's going to be terrible for everybody. Um, my parents were, I, I wasn't brought up with, with money, so I don't know how to do it and I'll never learn. Like those are limiting beliefs. They may feel really true to you. And there's evidence that other people could be like, well, I'm on my way. I'm learning to be different with money or we live in an abundant world and there's plenty of ways to grow my wealth. Um, one of the concepts that might be helpful for people is this idea of going with the current or against the current. Like I think probably many of you have heard about scarcity thinking, which is, or abundance thinking. And I find that with the current and against the current is a little bit easier for people to maybe relate to. So against the current with your money is when things are really fear-based, you're worried all the time, um, you have aggressive competition, like I'm going to beat that other guy or big materialism. Like for my status, I have to drive this amazing car. And it's great if you want that. 
but to just check in with why are you doing that? Another really good indication is when something awesome happens to someone you know, mm. that your reaction isn't, yay, I'm so excited for you. It might be either they didn't deserve that or they weren't honest or why not you immediately me? go into, <laughs> why not me? I'm not good enough. Why aren't I there? It should be all those reactions. That's against the current. Yeah. And to be aware, okay, when you're going against the current, can you get ahead? Yeah, but it's really hard. I mean, think about swimming. If you were swimming in a river and you were going with the flow, it's just a lot easier. Could you get where you want to go? Yeah, but it's so much more difficult. And then with the current are things like um, optimism, positive beliefs, hopefulness, taking inspired action, generosity lives there, being ex truly excited for people in your life when something good happens to them. Um, that's all with the current. Hmm. And so the first part is to notice when you're against the current. And some of the noticing is can be um, visceral. You can feel it. Going against the current feels restricted. It feels scary. So if I say the word to you, either budget or diet, how does that feel? <laughs> for, for most people, yeah. for most people, restrictive, like yeah. ugh, who wants to be on a diet or a budget? It feels that's against the current feeling. It's, um, yeah, it's worrisome. It's fearful. It's negative with the current it feels expansive. It feels um, like sunshine in Chicago in the middle of January. It feels <laughs> really, really good. That's where I'm from. Yeah. Um, and optimism. So those are some ways that we can actually feel into if we're going with the current or against the current. I, I love that message because as you, as you mentioned, there are so many words that we assign so much emotions and, and different types of meaning instead of just being free about about the word because it's, it's just a word it doesn't have to have a, a an emotional uh, baggage in us and we can always shift our mind towards seeing that those words as also freedom because for example mostly the the people during the weekend don't eat the same as they eat during the week so when you hear the word uh, diet, as you mentioned, you can just think that you are going to go into control a little bit, but you are going to be free of some weight. And instead of just thinking that you are going to be restricted in the food that you can eat, it's just having a lot more control. And also budget is having more control on your money instead of just... Uh, spending in things that you don't really need and in just some weeks or months you will find some things in your closet that says when do I even buy this thing Be or why do I even bought so many pairs of shoes or I don't know suits whatever it is no so yeah I, I love that message because Many people uh, assign just uh, meaning to certain words, and that's very damaging towards releasing the pressure. No, and for sure. What What can you tell people that um, sometimes they have money, they start uh, earning, they start investing, they start saving more, but something happens and in just a couple of months, they are back in the same place. They, they don't seem to find the, the confidence to keep the money. It just goes away from them. Yeah, um, it could be um, uh, several things. It's kind of like diet, a doctor diagnosing something without really yeah. knowing the patient saying in general, but a couple of things that I've seen with that. One could be there's these unconscious beliefs hanging out in the background. I don't really deserve this or more. It could be more likely rich people are dishonest. 
Mm-hmm. Money ruins people. Um, uh, I, I don't want to be like those. I, there's an expression, you know, filthy rich. I don't want to be like that. So if you're, if that's playing back here, why would you want to have money? And so at some level, you may be just releasing it because you don't want to be a bad person. You don't want to be someone that people don't trust. Um, so that is potentially a reason. And I think probably for most people, there's something playing back here that doesn't think that that should be the case, that they deserve money or it's a good thing. The other thing is sometimes just crappy stuff happens to people. Yeah. They, they have a partner who steals money for them. They were doing everything building up and then there's a global recession or a pandemic and it might not be necessarily something that they feel like I don't think people should beat themselves up. Like, what was I thinking? I created all of this. But it could be that there's a lesson. There's something in there that they're just supposed to be learning. And it could be really hard. And if you can sit in the place like, okay, what am I supposed to be learning about this? Coming through it can make you um, stronger. And I know you probably know this based on the kind of work you do with the people that you work with, David. But when you work out, and you're lifting weights, you're actually damaging your muscles and causing trauma to them. And it's the healing, it's the rest in between that makes your muscles stronger. So sometimes just crappy stuff happens and we don't wish it upon anybody. It sucks, it's bad. And maybe you can get to the place where you go, okay, what am I supposed to learn about this? How can I do something different? How can I be an example for my kids or someone else? So I think that all of this is tied up and it can be complicated, but things happen to us for our growth. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Finding meaning in the experiences, finding the the lesson that we are supposed to learn. And that's why many times it's a repeating pattern because we haven't learned the lesson, we are not still open to to free those things. And well, life gives you harder lessons many times, no? That's just the way it is. We, we can do something about that because we are supposed to just analyze also those patterns, trying to detach ourselves from another perspective and trying right. to see the things that, that are happening, as you say, in the background, no? And many times, like now, everywhere in the world, I think people are a little bit struggling with the financial situation because everywhere in the world, we have a lot of uh, things that are changing in terms of money, in terms of financial, in terms of jobs. So, that can be also stressing for people. And in that case, we can't do something with the external environment, but, but we can do something with our internal environment, no? For so, sure. yes, tell me. <laughs> this may be um, kind of a good segue. Uh, yeah. I, I know, um, I just want to set a little groundwork for this and then share some information that came to me today. So one of the things that I realized after I stopped being um, a traditional financial advisor is that I'm really intuitive with people's money stuff. Like I used to be able to always tell if someone was going to be okay financially. And I used to say, oh, I can tell without even knowing anything about their money. Like they didn't have to tell me details. And then I thought, oh, I was just listening a certain way, which I probably was. When we would write financial plans for people, most of the time I'd know what was going to be the result, but I created the plan to prove it to the client and go to the left brain side of things. One of the things that came um, really clear to me after I left that more traditional career is that, no, I really am kind of tapped into what's going on with people with their money in some ways. And I started what I like to think of as talking to money on other people's behalfs. So I do this through journaling I um, end up with, um, you know, people that work with me on this, where I'll deliver a specific message from money to them that ends up being transformational or healing or clarifying. 
depends on where they're at and they're all different, right? And then how I do this, I don't really know how it works, but I journal with money and I just ask questions and stuff comes through. So before, would it be okay, David, if I shared a message that I downloaded for the audience today? Yes, of course. Of okay, because it is a good segue from what you were saying. Yes. And I was, so I, I'm just going to read this um, in a short. I wrote, hi, money. Do you have a message for the listeners today that you'd like me to share? There is much news out there that can sound scary and disheartening. And there are also stories of good. Those these are all so. My question to you is, would you prefer to, which would you prefer to focus your attention on? When you watch or hear people discussing how awful and scary the world is, how bad the economy is and will be, how does it make you feel? I suspect awful, scared, and bad. And when you approach your life with these kind of poop-colored glasses on, it all looks bleak. You make fear-based decisions, which may draw in more of what you say you don't desire. Now, I'm not suggesting you totally ignore the suffering in the world, not at all. But how can you alleviate suffering in others if you're focusing on how bad everything is? Instead, swim in the water of gratitude and generosity. When you see and observe generous acts in others, you will feel better and inspired. When others see your generosity, hear and feel your gratitude, they will feel better. Let's get a virtuous cycle spinning, eh? Mm. So this idea of like, okay, there is stuff happening out in the world. How can I not get sucked down that negative spiral? And a couple of things that came out on this is generosity and gratitude. Mm. Um, gratitude is like the magic elixir of feeling better about things. It's so shocking to me because it seems so simple but there's so much research. Grateful people make more money. Grateful people live longer. They're healthier. I like there's actual scientific research about this and it doesn't take much. It takes a few minutes of focusing on what's working in your life. Um, reaching out and sharing with someone else how grateful you are for them. You'll switch their day around. Like that, you can make a difference in someone's day. So even like, just imagine coming from that place of feeling better in gratitude, thinking about your financial situation, than having the news on there's high inflation, there's war, there's blah, 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 all the stuff that's also out there. <laughs> oh, uh, that that's really, really powerful. And I think that it comes in a great moment to to use those two words about appreciating what we have instead of complaining of what we don't have or we haven't achieved because when you shift as you mentioned also the chemistry in our bodies that that is a research and that's where I can go further because that chemistry is just bringing a lot of neurotransmitters a lot of hormones that are going to make you feel empowered and are going to make you feel confident that you really have something to give to other people also just switching that gratitude when you start appreciating things you immediate almost immediately feel that you have that um, knowledge that you have that capacity to give something to other people that doesn't necessarily have to has to be money but it can be wisdom it, it can be knowledge it can be your own experience in other things. It can be a smile, even a smile. Right now that we don't have any more face masks, <laughs> we can see again people's faces and just a smile can change also the biochemistry of them. So that's a very, very powerful word. And that about giving is, is just also something that I listen a lot with many writers among them uh, when Dyer also used to say that just wishing on people's um, wellness well-being and all of those things in your mind in spite of not being able to give them something in that moment just that action and intention shifts the things no 
Yeah, I did that a lot during um, the beginning of the pandemic when we were walking around. We did a lot of walking because there wasn't much else we could do. <laughs> and I would, in my mind, may you be happy and well. Even if someone wasn't out, I'd look at their house, may you be happy and well. And it made me feel better. I have a belief that it makes things better for them. Yeah. Do I have proof it does? No. But <laughs> isn't that better than the opposite? Yeah, of course. Like, this is so awful. And, and um, yeah, so those there's very simple things that we can do that start to make us feel good. You know, there was a study that there's a book that came out a, a bunch of years back called Scarcity. And the researchers who wrote this book looked at um, research from all over the world. And when people's backs were really up against the wall financially, it's, you know, the terror that comes with that, their IQ actually drops. So being terrified of things doesn't allow you to make good decisions. decisions. And as you were saying with this idea of appreciation and gratitude, if you can raise your, lower your stress, raise your feel good, um, how, how good you feel, you're going to be better able to start to hopefully find your way out of a difficult situation. Yeah. And um, now that we are talking about all of those things, many, many of those um, gratitude messages and what you just read is it comes from your intuitive being. How can you explain people or have you always been an intuitive person in terms of the money? Um, yeah, so I don't know if I was, I wasn't aware I was. I made this big thing like, oh, intuitive people have this like magic mm. gift that no one else has. Like they get mm. this. And I think we all are intuitive. I know we are. We just don't always listen to our own good intentions. Um, I have the last, I don't know, 16, 17 years been a very committed meditator, which helps me lower some of the chat, chat, chat that's happening in my mind all the time. And I think that's been helpful in terms of me hearing more of my intuition. I also play with it a bit more and I'll get to the money part of things in a moment. But if the other day I was driving somewhere in my town going to see somebody and there's lots of different ways I can get there. And I practice just feeling into my in intuition by which way should I go. And in my mind, sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe it would have taken longer the other way or you know, whatever. So this one day I was going and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go this way, which feels a little longer. But I, th I said, I think I'm going to miss a hitting a freight train, not hitting, but, you know, getting stopped by a freight train. And I pull up and there was this big freight train going and it would have taken me 10 minutes longer. And I was like, yes, like I listened to that. And it's such a fun feeling when you notice those things happening. Um, the money thing, I talk to money. Once I started doing this, I started hearing of other people and mostly in other parts of the world, a couple in the US who also talk to money. Mm -hmm. And when I lead workshops and master classes for people, I walk them through a visualization where they start talking to money and getting a message for themselves. And it can be as simple as getting quiet, imagining money is, or whatever you imagine that is, like your higher self, money, um, whispering in your ear and giving you a message and then just start journaling. And invariably when I do this with people, they get some really beautiful message that comes out. I've always been here for you. You can trust I'm here. You know, you go girl, like whatever it is, they'll, yeah. they get something. So I think sometimes it's just asking and being quiet and just trusting that you'll hear an answer. And if you don't ask again. Yeah. I, I love that story. Um, it doesn't have to do with money, but it has to be with the intuitive mind. I also have a story of my daughter that one day we were walking. I, we love also to walk everywhere we can. And when we walk, we usually engage in conversations. She's just seven and a half. So she has more connection with that intuitive wisdom no <laughs> and so. she was asking me that sometimes she feels sad and 
and I told her, why do you think you, you feel sad? And, I, and she told me, I don't know. I want to, to know why do I feel sad? And I just told her, well, close your eyes and start asking, why do you feel sad? And the answer is going to come back. And just as I was finishing the sentence, she felt that that was a very good way to get out of the sadness, no? Or know why she was going to, she was feeling sad. And she told me, I think I'm going to do that because I, I now know why do I feel sad? And I don't want to feel like that anymore. So I will close more my eyes and, and see what happens, no? <laughs> She's so lucky to have you as a dad to teach her those things. Thank you. You know, most of my parents would have been like, oh, you're fine. Don't be sad. Like, and, uh, and, and not to even like make it okay to feel that way. And certainly not to ask kind of in our intuitive higher self. What a lucky uh, girl she is to have you as her dad. Thank you. I, I usually try to, to ask questions of her. And, and try to ask questions about everything. Uh, even if she usually does, because she, children are like that, but I ask more. So whenever she gets to a point where she finds the answer, that's when she says, oh, that's why it's happening. So the answers come just by asking the questions. And as you mentioned, we have to become better in asking the questions, as you mentioned, with the money, with your higher self, asking those questions and getting the answer, like a download. So we will have much better messages if we listen to our voices than to the noise outside, no? Yeah, and it gives you a way to check in on if, um, if when you're making a financial decision or yeah. um, to check in on does this feel right as well um yeah or just asking for a sign sometimes no because sometimes you need well i don't know what i'm supposed to do just help me to find a sign if i should move forward in this decision or not and just yep. try to stay calm and wait a couple of days because it doesn't take much to come the the signal and that's the way you have to go. And that's it, no? Yeah, and it's, and it's, um, and then trusting and acting on it if it feels right. Yeah, yeah. acting uh, and trusting, as you mentioned, because many times we are just asking, asking and don't doing anything. Well, that doesn't happen, in, no? Yeah, and I would say to come back to this conversation of worry, around where we started, you know, when I'm journaling with money or, or doing messages for money or an individual, whatever I'm doing, what comes back often is money doesn't want you to worry about it. It feels like you're actually doing something. Well, I have to, because it's like the responsible thing to do. That makes actually no sense because you're, you could make a decision out of a place of, oh, I have to, I'm worried about it or a place of calm and clarity and the worry doesn't help. It's not a financial strategy. Um, and, and yet it's just something that we've gotten used to. Many people have gotten used to operating out of. So I just wanted to add that, that if there's a way like through a gratitude appreciation, asking for a sign, trusting, acting on things that you can lower that stress level, you'll be able to move ahead more quickly and, uh, more effectively which um couples with the idea of um that people when they are in a struggle of financial situation and they they are dropping their intelligence and they are not taking good decisions because fear is behind all those things and when we are in fear our brain blocks this part, yeah. the prefrontal cortex yeah. doesn't work. So you won't do the best that is for you, either with money or with any other decision that you have to make. No. Yeah. 
So what would be one of the best or one of the recommendations today that you could share with uh, the audience in terms of staying calm and becoming more resilient in the in any kind of rough times? Yeah, I'll give um I'll give several ideas here if yeah, that's okay. Perfect. So um to the extent that you have some kind of contemplative practice, it doesn't mean sitting. I like sitting in meditation. It's helpful for me. Some people, it would make them crazy. Maybe it's <laughs> walking in nature. Even just taking a deep breath or listening to sounds outside of you, sometimes for people with a lot of anxiety, focusing on their breathing makes them feel more anxious. But if you are someone that feels comforted, um, many of us feel comfortable from taking a deep breath low in the belly. It um, oxygenates your brain, it slows your heart rate down, it kind of lets your um, sympathetic nervous system know everything's okay. It can be a breath. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. One strategy that I use, and I've taught, I, we've taught our kids this since they were little, they're young adults now, is when I think or say something I really don't want to have happen, I say cancel clear. And then, so cancel that thought, clear it away and replace it with something instead. So could be like, oh my God, what if we're going into another 2008? There's such high inflation. What if I lose my house? What if la la la? Cancel clear. I'm going to make, you know, I'm doing what I can. I'm going to save a little bit more money. Just replace it in something I'm watched over, something that you can replace it with. Even if you just get cancel clear and stop that thought, stop it. Yeah. That's helpful. Um, we talked about gratitude, starting your day. And I would add in gratitude for um, things material, but also things that money has helped you with. I'm grateful I have food in my refrigerator. I'm grateful I have money to pay for internet so I can have this conversation with you and I have a computer. I'm grateful that I have a paycheck or a job or a client I'm grateful that I might have family members that if I was really in dire straits would help me out. Like there's there's things that we can add um, gratitude in with uh, financial things. That's another thing you can do. And I would say from a more left brain tactical standpoint, I used to have clients when people um, would leave me voicemail messages and I'd get a message at like two in the morning from somebody that they were so worried about things like comment, like get actually work with somebody or go online and figure things out because things might not be as bad as you fear they are. Mm -hmm. And if they are, then you can start to come up with a plan. So work with an advisor, a trusted friend, somebody who maybe is really experienced in money things, if you can feel comfortable sharing it with them, because we're super secretive when it comes to money, mm -hmm. but it's hard to move ahead if you don't get support. So maybe like actually get a financial plan and see if things are um, as bad as you worry they are. Oh, those are all of them great messages so that they can move in that direction of feeling more calm now. I want to um, add one more in yeah, because I, I did um, this a lot during 2008 when I still had my practice, like market just kept going down and I felt out of control is um, to clean up some clutter, <laughs> like what you mm -hmm. can't see on the camera right now is right over here, there's piles of stuff. Like I don't show it. <laughs> and I know it's not, some people listening may be very meticulous and they would never have clutter. But what I know is that it, it takes our attention away. It's like, oh, I still haven't done that or I need to do this. And I invite for people that maybe are really good and would never, like they know they can't have a lot of paperwork around, a lot of mess. I'd invite them to look if they're carrying any mental clutter around, things that they did that they wish they didn't do, things they didn't do that they need to do, and just start handling stuff. And that will free up so much attention to start to find um, ways to feel calm, to make good decisions, to see opportunities. Yeah. Great. That's also very good because you are liberating space. You are telling the universe that you have a space to receive. So things are going to come. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. And I also wanted to share the one that you mentioned about uh, saying gratitude messages about the things that you have. I, 
usually when I do exercise, I have some minutes right when I am feeling the most intense workout. That's when I start the gratitude messages about mm -hmm. everything, about everything, about the gym, about the my car, about my apartment, about my job, about what I do. So all of those things, I, I usually start being grateful and it works really, really well for me to calm down. So you feel stronger, right? You, you yeah. have more energy. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's, um, that's what it gives me also. <laughs> yeah, that's a great suggestion. Oh, thank you. And finally, so that we can close and round up the topic, do you think that giving something that doesn't necessarily has to be be, be sorry be money can make you rich i do and let's focus first on money because i think that i mean studies on volunteering are show that people so i'm not saying that those things aren't good other ways to be generous mm -hmm. studies on volunteering show that people live longer kids that do generative acts that means making things better for other people are more successful as adults they have less depression so th all great wonderful but if we're thinking about financial resources, if you are hanging on so tightly to what you have and people just listening to this, not watching, I'm making clenched fists. If you're hanging on so tightly to what you have, like I'm not gonna be okay, we might be going into a recession, what does this mean? If your fists are clenched, can you receive? No. And that energy of I'm not gonna be okay is that same thing. If you open your palms and are open to giving, um, you are open to receiving. Now, some people are always giving, giving, giving and not being willing to receive and they're both important. You can't have a giver without a receiver. So we need both. Um, and what I've seen is that when things get really tough, people start closing up and charities and people in their lives that maybe really need money, people hold back on. And my personal experience and experience with you know, hundreds and hundreds of people I've worked with is that when you can open up, not more than you can afford to give, but helping someone out, it raises your energy levels and things start to flow in. You create space for things to flow in. What goes around comes around, but not always from the same person. Hmm. So being a great saver and a great giver, I think are really important financial strategies. Um, and I just want to add one more thing about that. If you're yeah. self-employed and in your own business, my strategy has always been to give what I want to get. So if I want to get more referrals, I give more referrals and without an expectation of something in return, because sometimes it comes back from the same person, but sometimes it comes back from someone that I just got a referral for a speaking engagement. I do a, a fair amount of work in the financial services industry. And it was from someone who I helped out with some materials like five years ago. And he referred me to someone in his company and she called. Like I, what goes around comes around and not necessarily from expected sources. Yeah. Yes, I agree also with that. Um, that's what I try to do also with more with this kind of work that, that, that we are happy and very grateful to have that we connect with a lot of people. I, I just believe that that's the future of our world. The good side of the world is that we create communities to help each other, to encourage. And I'm always open to, to invite people and to help people in whatever I can in terms of, of these connections that we can have now with technology, no? <laughs> yeah, I just got the chills when you said that. It's a very generous attitude out there as well. Yeah, thank you. And finally, what drives you to speak and write about money and prosperity? Yeah, a couple of things drive me to do this. I think the biggest one is that, um, especially in the United States, there's a lot of discussion about transfer of wealth and how much money people are gonna get. I, I came out of the financial services industry and um, what I, and I also see that so many people worry about money so much and it causes problems in relationships and anxiety and health issues. 
And what drives me is this thought that if people can get from the question of, am I going to be okay to how much can I give, everything in the world will change. So this idea of financial generosity, you don't have to be Warren Buffett or Bill Gates or Oprah in terms of starting a school in Africa, like awesome if you can do that, but it might be helping a neighbor out. It might be donating to some cause that's really important to you. And, um, it, and that's how I see the world changing. So if um, what I'm driven by is helping more and more people see m using money as a force for good in the world. Yes. We are so obsessed of that um, ambition of having money. Sometimes I just wonder these people that have trillions of money, what are they going to do with that? I, I don't even have the head to imagine, you know? Yeah. And what, how much good can they make with that money if they just spread around that? And that, as you say, it's going to come back. They are not even going to lose something, but they keep so tight to, to things that it's just, that's the, the side that we don't want to see and decide that we can shift into the other one of giving and creating those communities that are more empowered, no? For sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Helen, for this amazing conversation because it's just the right timing for many people to get around these okay. kind of messages. I really appreciate your help. And finally, can you just let people know what's the main part or the main site where they can find you, the main sure, link? Sure, Yeah, if you go to ellenrogan.com, it's E-L-L-E-N-R-O-G-I-N.com. Um, there's lots of stuff about programs. If you go to, it's a page on there, but you can go to directly to messagesfrommoney.com mm -hmm. and you can start to receive weekly messages if that's something interesting to you. Um, and if you go to ellenrogan.com forward slash gift, then you can download um, some really for, for some free resources that might be helpful for you on your journey to create more prosperity on purpose. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And we will put all the links in the episode. So thank you everyone for listening and we will see each other and listen to each other next time. Thank you. Bye.